We are happy to be here at French Lick for the Senior LPGA Championship. We're talking with defending champion Laura Davies. Laura, welcome to Back Nine Report TV. Thanks very much. Yes, good to be back. Nice and chilly again like it was last year, but hopefully that will work out again. Yeah, the second day last year got to be kind of uh, a trudge, didn't it? It uh, was cold and windy and overcast. It was a tough day. Oh, yeah. Yeah, but that's what makes uh, golf a great game. You you can come to a golf course one day and it's perfect weather and it seems easy and then you get a day like that and it's it's hard work. It's almost like a real job. <laughs> yes, that's for sure. And it's a little cool today, so uh, hard to practice here on Sunday, but uh, you'll get out and hit a few balls after a while and be ready to go tomorrow. Oh, yeah. Yeah. I mean, we've been here since Thursday, so we've had uh, a couple of rounds on the course and I have to say it's in excellent shape, even though all the, water, the rain they've had the last few weeks. Um, the course has taken it really well. Laura, you have had a storied career. Uh, let me just run some numbers by you here. Uh, 87 professional wins, including four major championships. Um, you've been, uh, you turned pro in 1985, so 35 year career. Um, if you could have drawn this up when you started, could it have been any better? No, to be quite honest with you. I mean, I was just hoping to make the first cut in my first tournament so I could afford to play the next week. Turn pro with the uh, a thousand pounds that my mother and stepfather lent me. And, um, yeah, I got off to a decent start. Uh, got a, a good sponsor. IBM came in after I had the good start and, it's been fun ever since. I mean, I've, you've, I've had my struggles. Obviously, every career, especially a long career, you have your ups and downs. Um, obviously, towards the end of your career, there's more downs than ups. But I'm still in there slugging away with the youngsters on the old PGA and uh, trying to get another win. It's a long shot, but you never know. If you stick in there, you never know. You've won all over the world. Europe, Asia, uh, Japan, Australia. Um being a world traveling golfer like that, uh, I mean, that has to be pretty interesting to see all the different cultures and winning in all the different areas. Yeah, yeah. I mean, there's no question. Um, doing what I do, you get to see virtually every part. I've never been to, I've been to Africa, I suppose, uh, Morocco is considered that, but never been to Kenya or anywhere like that. Countries I'd like to go and see. Um, if there's tournaments in them, I'll be there. But um, other than that, yeah, I've seen pretty much every golfing venue in the world at some point during my career, and you get to meet loads of different people. And, uh, yeah, I, I'm not complaining. It's been great. Being all the places you've been, is there one favorite that you just uh, you can't wait to get back to? Yeah, my favorite trip of the year is Australia. We go down there. I've been going down there since 1991 or 1990 or 91. So I've been going down there a long time, and we always have four or five tournaments at the start of the year. starts our year off. Um, and hopefully I'll be there in January uh, next year when I when the, the season starts again because I love the food, love the people, love the golf courses. It's just a great place to be. You have um, you have forty five uh, ladies European Tour wins. You won the Order of Merit seven times. Uh, played in uh, what eleven Solheim Cups, something like that. Yeah. 12, I'm sorry, I'm not, I forgot one. Um, tremendous record in Solheim Cup. You were a great competitor in that. And this last Solheim that was in Glen Eagles, you were an assistant captain. And you uh, kind of had said before that you were never really interested in doing that. But how did that experience turn out being an assistant captain at Glen Eagles? Well, I said I never want to be the captain. And there's a massive difference, believe you me, between being a captain and a vice captain. Uh, Katrina Matthew, um, she came to me at the Ryder Cup last year, actually, and said, I'm putting together my team and... I'd be really interested to see if you want to become one of my vice captains. And I said yes on the spot. And people say I've never wanted to do that, but I've never been asked to be a vice captain before because I played in the first 12 and then the next three that I, I wasn't involved in, uh, I think it was Annika was a captain, Lotta was a captain, and they didn't ask me to be a vice captain. So if you're not asked, you can't do it. Yeah, give me a little bit of your impressions of, of being involved with the uh, Solheim Cup this last time at, uh, at Glen Eagles. Yeah, well, I'd done TV, the Sky sky coverage of, of it, the last three Solheims, and I really enjoyed it. And so I wasn't torn in that I was ever going to say no to Beanie, but I was thinking, oh, I really enjoyed the TV. But having said that, now having been back part of it again, involved with the team set up, some decision-making. I mean, basically, Katrina does all the decision-making. We advise her, and maybe she takes a little bit of advice, but she's the one, you know, she's the captain. She, it's either going to be great for her or if you lose, it's she's going to get all the criticism. So she made most of the decisions, but you were still involved day to day with the players and, and the pairings. And it was just nice to, to be back in that team environment again, because obviously golf's a very individual kind of selfish sport. So for one week, every two years, it's great to be involved in a team. B 
being involved now as a vice captain uh, and playing in 12 as a, as, a, as a player, does your opinion change at all of being a captain sometime in the future? Not really. No, I just, it's, it's not, I'm not one of those people that's, because as a captain, you're, you're basically a cheerleader, a figurehead. There's nothing you can do. You can't really, you can make some good decisions. You can also, like I said before, make some bad decisions that maybe could cost a team, but I've never been. I'm never really one of those leader type positions. But if ever I was ever asked to be a vice captain again, I would say yes in a heartbeat. So um, possibly Katrina may be the captain again for the 2021, and that's coming to Toledo to Inverness Club. So we may see you there as a vice captain again. Well, I've no idea. I mean, I don't know. I'm, I would hope that Katrina would be offered the position. I don't know if she'd take it or not. Um, I'd hope she would because she did such a. I mean, she did a great job, and all the players loved her. Um, she was almost faultless the whole week, and that's hard to be when you're dealing with 12 players, 12 caddies, all the helpers. I didn't hear anyone complain, and, and in, a, in a situation like that, very unusual. So I think she deserves a chance to defend over in America, and as you say, in Toledo, where, from what I can understand, the galleries are going to be enormous, which would be quite a hostile environment. It would be a completely different feel to the whole week for the European team, so you need a good captain. Yeah, exactly. Well, let's delve into that a little bit. Um on our show the week before, um, the three of us uh, that do back in our report, we all felt that Europe would win eventually because you had more experience uh, and maybe being a little bit because it was a home game being at Glen Eagles. But um, with the six rookies on the American team, the fact that Stacy Lewis had to back out, which was one more veteran, so it left one more rookie in. Uh, when you got down to those last four or five matches on Sunday on the singles, Bronte Law and those the, the young the young woman at the end and coming down with Suzanne to hold the winning pot, uh, just uh, just pretty much fairy tale stuff. Yeah, well, that's why we start. We said all week it's been close. There was never really more than a point and a half in the whole match, which is unusual. Normally, one team breaks away a little bit and the other one comes back, but it was obviously eight all after the foursomes and the four balls were done. And we decided it was going to come down to the last three matches because it was such a an even contest. And that's why we put Suzanne Bronte and obviously um, Nordquist in the last match. Everyone hoped it would come down to, to Bronte or Pedersen and we wouldn't have to rely completely on Nordquist at the end. She she got her match taken care of, and I think we the the strength we put at the end was the the final piece in the puzzle. But you couldn't script it. I mean, Suzanne holding the winning putt on the 18th. If she holds it, we win. If she misses it, we tie, and we ultimately lose because they own the trophy. So, um, you, I don't think you'll ever see a, a better finish than that in Ryder Cup or Solheim Cup golf. Let's switch up subjects just a minute. Um, so you've been very involved with the Ladies European Tour over the years, and it seems to be in a real downswing right at the minute. Um, just uh, was announced that uh, did not renew the contract for the uh, chief executive, so you're looking for someone new now to fill that position again. Seems kind of like you're back to square one. Um, a lot of events canceled this year, uh, low number of tournaments available for the LET. Uh, you, do you have any solutions, any ideas? Ideas. How can we make the, the ladies' European tour strong again? Stop sacking the CEO after you win this the week after you win the Solheim Cup would be a good starting point. I have no idea why that decision happened. Obviously, the, the board didn't get on with Mark. I think Mark was doing – he inherited the job. He didn't go actively hunting for the job, and he was he inherited it. He, he, he embraced it. He was doing – he was doing okay because it's it's a hard sell in Europe all round. I know the European tour is now a world tour because we go everywhere, but it's a hard sell. And I think he was doing. And they've brought back um, someone is filling in an interim, Alexander Armas, who who had the job a while back. It's like a football manager, a soccer manager. You re never really want to go back to a manager that failed. I'm not saying she necessarily failed, but for whatever reason, she left the tour. I never think you should go back. You should always be looking forward. And Mark hadn't done anything wrong. So I would, if I would have been on the board, not that I am, so I, I don't really have much say in it because I'm, I'm not on the board. But um, I'm surprised they got rid of him, especially on the back of all the great feelings everyone had for winning the Solheim Cup. And that's our marquee event. Every, every four years, we get to showcase women's golf to the world. We did a great job and we sacked our CEO. So I'm, I'm, at, I'm at a loss. But like I said, I don't put myself out there on the board. So I really... I, have, I can have an opinion, but I don't get a vote. 
Well, and that's the thing. I mean, the Solheim Cup is such a huge uh, income generation tool for the Ladies European Tour. That, they lose money in the alternate years, and when the Solheim Cup comes around, they get an influx of cash, and that gets them through to the, to the next one. Um, and so it appears... All the good names, as soon as they start winning in Europe, then they gravitate to the LPGA Tour because the money's so much better there. We understand that. Um, is there Are there sponsors that want to be involved, but they just don't like the product right now in Europe, or, or what do you think? I don't know. I mean, we've been struggling for a while. Well, it, it was, it's the money. It's basically the money. When, when obviously, with Greece and Spain, all the, all the problems in Europe financially, what, seven years ago now? But, you know, some of those countries have picked up a bit. Um, Spain, to be fair to them, have got three tournaments now. But we've had nothing in England. So being English, I'm ashamed of that. And that's a terrible thing that we don't have tournaments in England for the women. The Swedish have dropped off the map. They don't have tournaments anymore. So somewhere along the line, and, and there's all this good feeling for women's sport and women in business around the world. Well, in Europe, there doesn't seem to be so much good feeling for women's sport. So let's hope that Alexandra Armas, you know, she's taken over on a temporary measure. Hopefully she can be the, the deciding factor. Uh, I, I, wish her, I wish her well, but it's, uh, it's hard because some of these young girls aren't getting a chance to, to become good players, good enough players to go on the LPJ and earn the big money and play against the best players. And you can't, you can't fault Georgia Hall, Charlie Hull, Mel Reed, Bronte Law. They want to play against the very best players, but most of them started out on the European tour when it was a little bit stronger. Now it's a real struggle for these girls to get on a really good run of golf. Tournament golf, too. You can go and practice all you like, but tournament golf is where it is, and that's where you learn. Yeah, those are uh, excellent points. Um, and with the importance of the Solheim Cup, we really need a strong Ladies European Tour bringing young women up to at least, whether it's a developmental tour or whatever, to have those European women to compete in future Solheim Cups. So it's, 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 it's very important. Well, the thing is about this last Solheim Cup, you say that about the European Tour, but every single player that was in the European team this year for the first time was an LPGA player. And that, unfortunately, is going to be a problem for these young girls because it just shows there's not enough tournaments for them to get enough points to get an automatic pick. What's happening is, because you get points in majors, all the LPGA players are picking up points in the majors, play a few tournaments in Europe, and obviously because they're the best players, they're picking up points. Um, and so for the first time ever, it was a complete shutout for just European tour players, which, which is why we set up the qualification for it years and years ago was so that four players, or it used to be five, from the European Tour would automatically get in from from that the, from our home tour. It didn't happen this time, not one player. The LPGA Tour, uh, Michael Wan, and the PGA Tour, Jay Monahan, both offered maybe a help or assistance to the LET. Uh, do you ever, and they were politely told thanks, but no thanks uh, a year or so ago. Uh, do you see any future partnership uh, that would work with the LPGA Tour or the PGA Tour? Well, my understanding, and again, I'm not on the board. You only hear rumours, so it's very dangerous to go with rumours. But I'm going to go with rumours. I was told that the LPGA's idea of the LET was small small prize funds and basically a feeder tour for the LPGA. Well, it can never be that. If they come back with, a, with an offer of real substantial support to get tournaments going, four, 500,000 euro tournaments, the, the, the player, the young girls that are coming out, can earn some money if you finish if you finish in the top 10 you lose money on a 200,000 year if you take a pro caddy with you that is and that can't happen that's what I heard Mike one might turn around and say well that's not what we offered but again because I'm not on the board I'm not privy to the to the ins and outs but that was kind of what I was was told that it was basically going to be a feeder tour and that can't happen. Laura during your career you have played against some of the game's best women golfers over the years um who was one of the toughest competitors or one of the one of the players that you really enjoyed playing against? Well, Kelly Robbins and I used to have some good battles. We both peaked at around about the, the, the mid-90s, 93 through 97, and we had a good few battles down the stretch. Annika was just after me. I had a couple of dusts up with Annika, and she came out on top pretty much every time. Same with Kari. I'd say they're tough competitors. But my favorite ever receiver was always Nancy Lopez because she was my hero and I just loved watching her play. She, she taught me so much. She'd hit it in the trees. I'd be looking for a gap up in the trees. She'd chip it out sideways, wedge it to 10 feet, hold the putt, make her par. One out of 20, I'd make a birdie. The other 19, I'd make a bogey or worse probably. 
and so she taught me the course management but to play against her she was she's not only one of the best players ever she's one of the nicest too so I'd say Nancy but if you want tough Webby and uh, Annika would be two of the toughest ones You've received some fantastic honors uh, over the years. Um, um, Queen Elizabeth uh, uh, brought you into the Order of the British Empire. So you were knight. I'm, I'm sorry I introduced you. I should have said Dame Laura Davies. I, I'm sorry about that. Um, also, um, in 2015, you were the, one of the first seven women to be offered membership into the Royal and Ancient. Uh, where does that stack up with all the things that have happened to you over the years? Oh, I mean, it's it's an incredible honor, really. I mean, the the, the damehood, or whatever, I, mean, yeah, I suppose it's a damehood, um, that was probably the highest honor I've ever had. But equally, being how I love St. Andrews so much, being made a member of the RNA, um, it's incredible, really. No women had ever been in there. Now there's there's a, they've got a, obviously upwards of 20, maybe, I think probably more members than that, I don't know, but... Um, yeah, it was nice to be thought of highly enough to be put in as one of the originals. Laura, the, let's talk in just a second about the Legends Tour here. Um, and uh, Jane Blaylock uh, helped originally start the Legends Tour along with uh, 24 other women. Um, for women 50 years and older, uh, over the years you've had some nice schedules, uh, seven, eight events. I think you're down right now to just a few events. The two majors, uh, uh, last year the USGA came in and started the U.S. Senior Women's Open, which you won at, uh, at Chicago Golf Club. This year the U.S. Senior Women's Open was held at Pinehurst at Pine Needles. Um, also last year... You won both the U.S. Senior Women's Open and the Senior LPGA here at French Lick, the two majors on the Legends Tour. And so you're defending champion this year. Um, what are you seeing? What, what do you think the outcome? What do you look for the future for the Legends Tour and for the Senior Women's Tour? Well, again, it's you've just got to hope that corporate America, because basically it's going to be played in America, the Legends Tour, um, can see the worth of, of showing these young girls that, you haven't got a 10-year career. You've got a lifetime career if you're really good enough and you really want it because obviously you have to you have to qualify for the Legends Tour by having a good career on the LPGA Tour ultimately. Um, and it would just be nice if they'd get behind us because I think if we go to... I mean, this is in the middle of nowhere, so the galleries aren't, aren't big at French Lick, not because people don't want to watch us, it's because it's a really hard golf course to walk. But when we get to some of the smaller towns that we play these events, it was Chicago Golf Club and Pine Needles, Galleries were big, so there is a worth in us. People want to come and see. Nancy can't play at the moment because she's got a bad knee, but they want to see the Pat Bradleys, the Betsy Kings, not hitting it 300 yards like the young girls, but still got something to offer. And if corporate America could just um, be kinder to the women's game, because, you know, the men's champions tour, they play for fortunes. And uh, I know it's a different, completely different product, but it would be nice if they got in behind us. Well, we always enjoy coming here to the uh, Senior LPGA here at French Lick. Uh, we love it down here, and it's always great seeing the uh, senior players. Uh, and uh, you're always so forthcoming and wonderful to talk to. And Laura, Dame Laura, thank you so much for taking a few minutes talking to us, and uh, we wish you all the best going forward. Thank you very much. Nice to be on your show.